Archie's TV Laugh Out Issue 13 Sabrina tells Hilda to make her friends feel at home, and Hilda tells her angrily not to worry because they always act like they own the place. But she can use magic on them, so she'd know why she was so worried. Sabrina tells her not to cast any spells tonight for the party. I guess she will. Hilda's honest with her, saying that she can't promise that, and says that she's already taken a few precautions. Because they tend to move things around and break them, she zapped everything to the floor. This seems genre savvy considering that her friends do break stuff in her house in the 70s comic. But when Archie tells Jughead to help him move a chair and he can't, Moose lifts some of the floorboards off with it when he lifts it. You'd think that he'd never be able to lift it, because it's glued to the floor with magic. It wouldn't matter how strong he is. Her spell specifically stated that everything would be pinned to the floor. Sabrina says Hilda can't blame them for that, and it's her own lack of trust. But why blame her for her lack of trust in people who break stuff in her house? Hilda was worried about that happening, and it did, so she was right. Hilda says that every witch knows you can't trust anyone under 175 years old. She threatens to use magic to chase a teenager's home, because she doesn't want to expend the effort of magically undoing any more damage they'd cause, even if it'd only be a few seconds. She leaves, and Sabrina gets told to join the party. Betty wonders what's wrong because Sabrina is uptight, being impressively considerate. Jughead brings them some punch, running over to them while the drinks are on a plate, and luckily they don't all fall over and spill from that. Everyone hates the taste of the punch. Sabrina wonders where Jughead got it, and it turns out he got it from the cauldron in the kitchen. So Sabrina's friends start changing into frogs, and Sabrina blames Hilda for it when they weren't supposed to drink her brew. Hilda tells her not to be upset because some of the nicest frogs she knew used to be humans. And she laughs because she could always change them back. Sabrina wishes she could have parties like normal teenagers, calling Hilda out. She says that even if her noisy friends stay quiet, Hilda gets suspicious. She once again says Hilda turned them into frogs, when Jughead never told her that he got handed the drinks by Hilda. And Hilda fortunately looks sad when told that this isn't how family's supposed to be. This keeps the story from being outright cruel to Sabrina. When her aunts make themselves look like the bad guys, they let her call them out on it and don't punish her or reassert their authority. And the writer isn't treating Sabrina like she's in the wrong. Instead, Hilda tries to look in the book for a situation like this. Sabrina says that her book definitely doesn't have answers like that. It wouldn't? Isn't she looking in the magic book? Wouldn't she know that it'd have a cure for the frog potion? And why would they need to use a cure instead of one of those omnipotent witches instantly returning everyone to normal just by pointing? I understand why Sabrina didn't do that right away, because she wanted to spend the time calling Hilda out first, which she wanted to do for a while, and Hilda doesn't care. Hilda says she's been racing her to be a good witch. I know. Sabrina would rather be a good person, and she's randomly asked if she would turn her back on all of her magical power. Unless she means to say that continuing to be good would inevitably get her powers taken away by Della, which would make me wonder what took her so long then. Hilda's response doesn't make any sense. Hilda eventually cries and lies about it, and says out of nowhere that it was written a long time ago that a child should lead them, and out of nowhere, she says that Sabrina's letter out of the darkness. That's out of character for someone who spent the whole story complaining about Sabrina being good like a cartoon villain. And she better not have made a Bible reference. Why would a witch do that anyways? Sabrina thanks her for bringing them back to normal. And they have no memory of what happened. Archie says this is one of the best parties they ever had. Why? As far as they can remember, they just got here and nothing's happened the whole time. Sabrina tells them while holding a guitar that they've got a lot to sing about. And Zelda wonders what's gotten into Hilda as she dances, and says that she got silly and sentimental for a moment. Lampshading the confusing writing doesn't make the problem go away. I do appreciate that Hilda's a soft side. It makes sense because she loves Sabrina. But it always seems confusing that someone who wants Sabrina to be an evil witch would ever agree with her and do the right thing. It's just written to have a happy ending. But Sabrina could have turned the back to normal herself. She didn't have to waste a bunch of pages nagging her into it, boring me. This was a typical Sabrina story where Sabrina has the inexcusably dumb idea of having her friends over for a party 
When of course she can't trust magic not to happen there when Hilda's home. She could have given her movie tickets. Instead, Jughead mistakes potions in a cauldron for punch and gets her friends and them turned into frogs. Rather than Sabrina using magic to turn her friends back to normal instantly by pointing, she spends a long time telling Hilda that she's tired of this kind of stuff happening and wants to be a good person and not a good witch. We know. I guess this was considered novel when the issue came out because this was a really early issue. But she has this kind of argument with her so much in a 70s comic that I'm bored of it. It's a relief that Hilda gets convinced to admit that she was wrong and turn her friends back to normal. But it's out of character that she cheers up and dances. This kind of plot ends up happening a lot as it is. Archie's TV laugh out 14, the ghouls of the house. Gail teleports to Sabrina's house because she was receiving disturbing interference on her TV witch control set and wanted to come down and investigate what caused it. Huh? Then Hilda complains that the trouble is that Sabrina wants to throw a party for her mortal friends. Why would that cause interference on Dell's TV? After too many panels, Dell says she can have the party at a creepy house on a graveyard hill. And Sabrina is apparently so desperate for a place to throw a party that she doesn't mind that it's a creepy house on a graveyard hill. After Sabrina hugs her for letting her have a party, eventually, Sabrina leaves the house, and Della explains that she's going to show Sabrina the proper way to throw a party for mortals, since she hates mortals. She teleports some people to her named Hugo and Igor, the servants of the party. Hilda thinks they're beautiful. Della says that for the entertainment of the evening, there's going to be a vampire and a werewolf to scare the mortals. Della thinks that when Sabrina sees the fun she's missing, she won't want to be like mortals anymore. Hilda confuses me by saying she's going to recommend Della for a promotion when she's already the head witch. And she doesn't get told she's being silly because Della's in a good mood. Hilda and Della spy on the outside of the house. Sabrina's friends are scared of the house because it looks like a haunted house. They go in and Hilda hears screaming. Predictably, of course there's a comedic twist where all of Sabrina's friends are dancing. And I'd take a happy ending over a sad one any day. Veronica says she never thought Sabrina would have a spook party like this. And it turns out her friends think she hired actors to dress up like ghouls. So Sabrina thanks Stella, who reveals that she thinks witches are immortal. This story was about Del letting Sabrina throw a party in an empty house because she wants to scare the mortals there with scary looking people. And Del's so used to liking scaring mortals that she assumes that Sabrina will be converted to sharing her opinion by seeing her friends get scared. But it fails because her friends either assume they're people in costumes, or Sabrina lied that they were. The pacing of the story was too slow. But at least the ghoul summoned by Della didn't really have any dialogue, wasting my time. They weren't dumb comedy characters like the ghoulies they reminded me of, making the story feel unoriginal. At first I skipped this story by mistake because the GCD site was too lazy to give it a proper description or summary. And I was scrolling past all of the stories to see which ones were the Sabrina ones. Archie's TV Laugh Out Issue 16, When You Wish Upon a Star Sabrina feels sorry for Archie and wonders what's wrong. He complains that it's the same thing as usual, that Veronica's always mad at him because he never has the money to take her anywhere. She could date someone who does. I guess she's too picky. So she's pushed away every guy but Archie, who she still insists on dating. Maybe Reggie's the only sort of rich guy available for her who wants to date her in her high school. Archie wastes a page redundantly complaining that he's broke and that wishing is pointless. So Sabrina decides to help him. She tells him to wish upon a star. At first, he's at least smart enough to doubt that'll work. I'm glad Sabrina told him that if the wish isn't too impractical, he'll get it granted. Because specifying that is smart to try to prevent him from getting too ambitious with his wishing. Too bad when Sabrina casts a spell, it's not in a thought bubble. So I'm wondering why Archie doesn't react to it. Archie wished his dad would give him extra money. So he does, and he can afford it because he had some good success at work thanks to the spell. It would have sucked if he gave it to him when he couldn't afford it, so I like the extra success part. Realistically, Archie says it was just a coincidence. 
So Sabrina gouts him into making another wish. That Ronnie would come here and make up with him so that he could take her out on another date. So she does. She apologizes to Sam for being mad at him. It shouldn't take a spell for this to happen. So he takes her to an expensive restaurant as I'm waiting for something to go wrong for him. He says it'd be a better evening if there weren't so many cars around. So he wishes they were stranded there by themselves. Too bad Sabrina didn't have the sense to remove the spell when she wasn't supervising him anymore. They notice that the cars are gone. Who knows what happened to those people. And the car doesn't start because the battery's dead. And because he used up his third wish already on a petty problem, the car won't start. And Veronica wishes she didn't go out with him, even though going to the restaurant was worth it. And we aren't told she could have gone there someday with someone else. This story was about Sabrina feeling sorry for Archie's money problems after he takes up two pages complaining about it. She casts a spell so that he could wish on a star three times. So he has a great day with Veronica, but he wishes the cars around them away. Wasting his third wish so that he can't do anything about his car not starting. It was still surprisingly responsible of Sabrina to restrict him to only three wishes. I didn't expect that. Even if letting him have any wishes was still begging to backfire if he got too ambitious. I'd be happier if he was on a date with Betty instead because she wouldn't mistreat him. I guess the writers figured that would be too boring because there'd be no conflict unless they had Betty be unreasonably mean or had Archie be ridiculously unlucky. I'd take the latter though. It was so nice to see Sabrina get to do something good with her magic. I found this story deep in Laugh Comics 1974 issue 53. Good thing I can find out where the reprints of the Sabrina stories are with the GCD website. Archie's TV Laugh Out issue 17. Jughead says Ethel's eyes don't match. That only makes sense if she's supposed to have eyes of two different colors like the gun commander. He just says this as a joke. Sabrina tried to comfort Ethel and lied to her that they don't mean it and are just trying to be funny. Sabrina lies to Ethel again that she's pretty, and at least Ethel's smart enough to not believe her. Ethel sarcastically refers to the time she went to the zoo with her father as a kid as a date, and even he made her wear an oversized turtleneck that day. It doesn't make sense that people would turn her down when she offers to pick up the tab, because why would they want to pay for something if they don't have to because of her? After Ethel complains that she's ugly, Sabrina decides to cast a love spell on a medallion for her and thankfully has her spell constricted to a thought bubble this time. She tells the medallion to make everyone see Ethel's inner beauty. How many times does Ethel have to complain that she's ugly before Sabrina decides to actually make her look pretty instead of just constantly casting love spells and not respecting people's consent? Sabrina tells Ethel to wear a medallion and outright tells her to love the medallion. Ethel gets told it's a luck charm and thanks her, despite being wise enough to doubt that a medallion could help her most of the time. With the medallion on, she gets Pop Tate to call her a sweet person. At least he complimented her personality. If the guys were just complimenting that, it'd actually feel like it was getting them to see her inner beauty. Even then, most of the time she's only a character who complains or chases after Jughead, which isn't sweet and charming. Ethel thanks Pop Tate and Reggie apologizes to her for earlier. Too bad he's too vague when he says she's of great character. Ethel finds out Jughead wants to be forgiven too. It's sad that it requires a spell to get this to happen. Jughead's brainwashed by the medallion into lying that the only reason he teases her is because he has a lot of love and respect for her. Then Ethel blabs to Reggie that she's wearing a love medal. Sabrina could have not called it a love medal and she'd still have this problem because she'd still say that it's a lucky charm and show it to Reggie. Sabrina could have easily avoided this problem if she didn't tell Ethel that the medallion was a lucky charm and instead just said it was a gift to her as a sign of their friendship. And she could brainwash her into wanting to keep wearing it. Instead Reggie wants to put it on to prove that the medallion doesn't work. Out of nowhere it turns out that because the medallion was only made to work for Ethel, if someone else put it on, it'd work in reverse. That makes no sense. She wouldn't imagine this to be the case because she wouldn't want that. It'd make more sense if it just did nothing because it's not for Reggie. Sabrina says she doesn't want to watch as Reggie tells people to love him. Why wouldn't she want to watch? 
when as it turns out, she means that people are gonna hate Reggie, not Ethel. Okay, this is much better to see. I can't get enough of this. Even if there's no reason this would be a part of the spell either. Jokehead says, I never liked your smug-looking face, Reggie. Doesn't everyone already hate him, though? The necklace just makes people mad at him to say what they always felt. Reggie is glad Jughead said this because it proves he was right about the medallion. We see a fist and a pow sound effect instead of his fists actually impacting Reggie, sadly. It takes some of the fun out of it that way. Pop Tate says, I can never stand this conceited little punk either. So we get to see him throw food on his face. Ethel gets to tell him off, You've always been picking on me and poking fun at me. Well, now is my time to give you a few good pokes. She misses her punch, sadly. Why did she call her punch a poke? Archie's right that Reggie deserves everything he gets. And he punches Reggie in the face. At least this time we see the impact. Even if Reggie looks stupid from vibrating cartoonishly. So if the comics allow to show the impact of punches, why doesn't it always? It's not funny not to. Somehow Ethel thinks the love medallion doesn't work, even though it clearly worked for her. She gives Sabrina the medal back. At least she says thanks anyways instead of annoying me by being rude. At least Sabrina didn't annoy me by making things go back to normal with magic when I can't relate to sympathizing with Reggie. Ethel's cheered up and says she has charms she never knew she had. And Archie asks Reggie if he's okay, and Sabrina looks on the bright side. This story did everything right. Instead of actually being yet another story where Sabrina makes people fall in love with Ethel, the love for Medallion has people say they love her personality. It's a shame they don't provide specific evidence of her being sweet and charming. Because that developed on her character. Well, of course it's shady of Sabrina to use a brainwashing medallion, and she cheered Ethel up in the end, after she gave it up from seeing that for no reason at all, it made people hate Reggie when he wore it. When you'd think if it's designed specifically for her, it'd do nothing when someone else wears it. I'm glad Sabrina didn't undo the spell herself, even though there's no reason she wouldn't since she felt sorry for Reggie. Because I loved seeing Reggie get called out for a couple pages. Sabrina using a brainwashing medallion and Jughead being made to look surprisingly mean with Reggie at the start of the story are the only things wrong with it. Otherwise it was a nice treat seeing Ethel be treated well and Reggie be punished.